um, um, what we did to come up the way uh, with the way in which we set up the camera was we we shot um, a whole variety of tasks using different settings. Um, you know, um, there's so many settings on the can, and once once you start getting into the menu, it's a bit like you've suddenly opened the, the manual to a Russian nuclear submarine, and it's written in Russian. Um, <clears throat> you know, you you get into family tree after family tree after family tree, and about six links down the chain, you can't even remember where you were. It's um, it really is tricky stuff, and um, it takes a very long time to. Um, uh, to remember it, you can, um, uh, and there's so much stuff that you can just forget, which is deadly. Um, you can make just one tiny little setting mistake, so you really do need to have a checklist of the way in which you set up the camera, otherwise you will be in tears. Um, <clears throat> and Steve, again, will sort of explain this later, but um, we basically um, shot material in a whole bunch of different ways and basically um, took it to our post house um, on house which is a wonderful place called the post group in Hollywood um, and we our color time of the last season was Keith Shaw an absolutely wonderful colorist um, <clears throat> um, but most people don't have the kind of facilities that we have on house obviously you know this is you know, you're working in a color suite that costs five hundred dollars an hour with a, you know, one of Hollywood's top colorists, and using a system called New Coder, where you can sort of just grab somebody's face and slightly change the color of it, and then automatically track it, and um, you know, stuff like that, which isn't really available and against the general principles of five D filmmaking. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention that because. Um, it's kind of important in the way in which I work, but there's, so there's that way of working and then there's a whole other way of working. But what I meant to say was that um, we basically got him to look at all the ways that we recorded footage on his scopes. And to me, scopes are just kind of like things with wiggly lines on and they look like something from Wall Street. But, um, <clears throat> uh, but he could tell that we, um, you know, we were capturing maximum dynamic range when we arrived at a series of settings that we then adopted for shooting on house. And um, so I wanted to say that. Um, um, and uh, I think um, this is probably the point at which we want to go into our uh, keynote thing, though. Right. Are we, are we good for that? I think we are. So this is how we, um, um, you know, what we ended up with and uh, what's important in terms of shooting. And uh, um, obviously the menu settings are in different places. Canon did that just because it's obviously very humorous to them to, to um, <laughs> put the buttons in different places on every camera. Right. Uh, <laughs> so it's just to start out. I mean, uh, we got a couple of people in our last workshop that uh, kind of just hit the Walmart and bought like the three pack of cards and they weren't UDMA and they were getting like incredible drop frames. So you always have to use a UDMA, which stands for ultra direct memory access, which means nothing to pretty much anybody else, but it just basically means it can write faster. So, and when you're recording video, that's definitely something you need, you know, cause you're not just capturing one frame, capturing, you know, 24 frames in one second. So, and then uh, also when you put your card in, you always want to format it cause you don't know where it's come from. But like for us, because we use so many different cameras, like sometimes they're not our own, so we're just always having to like make sure there's nothing on it or else you're gonna have to go back through and erase one by one, and then that'll kinda take more time than it's needed. And then uh, your camera always has to be on manual to unlock all the features. Like if yeah. it's on, if it's on uh, <laughs> aperture priority or shutter priority or something, you're not gonna get your full menu. And then you want to go in and you want to clear all your custom functions just because uh, someone might have set your camera goes off at 2.30 in the morning and uh, turns red and you don't want to do that. So here's all the cool stuff, but I can actually switch to the live view and kind of go through it all with you guys. Can we do that? All right, so close that, go into the menu. So 
So the first one is peripheral illumination correction. And what that does is um, some of the lenses that'll start to barrel, it'll get really bright around it, and then it'll try to compensate by that by doing vignettes and doing stuff like that. And just basically, you don't want it to touch any of your image. You just want it to be completely flat. So you always want to turn that off. Can I, can I ask one thing? Um, how many people here are Canon users? Um, 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 are you on Nikon? Nikon? Yeah, okay. I mean, does this stuff make sense? I'm not sure how different the menus are on them. A couple of these specific options are available on some of the Nikons, but some of the other settings I saw in the previous slide definitely do make sense. I think a lot of this will cross over. Do you, right. do you use the pro ones, like the D3S or? Uh, yes. Okay. I don't really know the menu for that one. I know the 5100 and the other one. Uh, no, I'm not sure. I know you're a 7D um, <clears throat> they're, pretty, they're pretty much the same yeah. from the 7D to the 5D. Right, all the, all the menu things on the top, they're, they're obviously accessed by the little wheel on the top, as you probably know. And you can, you can yeah. access them, or you can access them by the joystick on the back. There's a joystick that kind of just moves, and you can kind of scroll through it, which is kind of an all-in-one. Or you can scroll through your menu with your aperture wheel. So. No. And then some people will say that doing Adobe RG like, will actually give you better skin tones, but I haven't seen anything because it's, it's more of like a print profile. Mm -hmm. So I've just never really noticed the difference. But I mean, if you're into that, you can uh, kind of run it. So, and then as far as the auto power off, we always set it to 15 minutes. Some people set it to off, and some people set it to like one minute, but 15 minutes is usually a pretty good time. So, I mean, if you walk away from your camera and it's off, it's gonna be on all day, and you know, it'll burn your sensor up. And when the sensors get hot, you know, they can, they can tend to kind of put more noise into the image and stuff like that, and you might have to kind of get it clean and repaired. So we always do 15 minutes. LCD brightness. This thing will totally mess everything up if you don't turn it off. Because uh, basically, it's going to compensate for everything that's outside. It's reading. There's a sensor in it that's reading the light. So if you're outside, it's going to get really bright. And you're going to be like, oh, I got it. And then you're going to come inside, and it's going to get really dull. And you're going to compensate on your exposure. And you know, you're know probably going to be over two or three stops. So you always want to go in there, turn that off. And then um, you can either set it to 405. It's, it's basically just according to your eye. I like to set mine at 4 because it looks a little bit under. And like I just know that mine, I always kind of expose just slightly under just for my stuff because I can always kind of pull up in grading. But some people like 5 or 6. But like we've found that like 4 is not too dull and like 5 isn't too like milky and like washed out. So those are the optimal settings that we've found to be the best as far as being on the back. But you know. If you're going out to a Marshall monitor and stuff like that, this this doesn't so apply. So you said turn it off. So bring it up. Turn yeah, turn this on the turn manual. Turn off manual. Okay. Yeah, just because uh, if it's on auto, it's going to fluctuate. Because mm -hmm. like it's like your cell phone, you know, you go outside, it's going to get really bright. You come in, and it's going to get really dull. So, and then the live view sensor. So here's the whole live view grid mode. So you want to go into the, the first one, and then you want to go into stills plus movie, and then you want to go into movie display. So that one is kind of gonna, it's gonna give you your movie display through like the whole thing, and it's gonna give you a full like simulation of your exposure. So instead of like, if you were shifting it, if you did all the other ones, like if you shifted it, your, uh, your LCD would stay the same. So like if you were on F8 and you went to F11, nothing would change. So when you go to the stills and movie display, it, it's actually going to change and show you that you're underexposed or overexposed. And then um, 24p, 30p, it just really depends on like what you're doing. I mean, 30p is going to give you more information. I mean, if you're going to try to get the most at it, if you had to do some kind of like slow-mo, I guess 30p would be better than 24, but I mean, you would want to be maybe on a 70 at that point. And then there's good old 640 by 480, which I've never seen anybody shoot with. <laughs> so let's get back home. And now there's nothing in there. And now here's all the custom functions. I don't, we don't usually mess with anything except for like the image, and we disable all these. 
like the long exposure noise reduction, it kind of just seems to give you this weird like pattern noise and it kind of it kind of simulates and tries to take away stuff and sometimes it takes away stuff that's vital and it kind of gives you a little bit more artifact so we always turn those off. And uh, it's the same thing on the high S. The highlight tone priority, basically what it does is it tries to fit all of your compression and all your tones by like cutting and clipping your signal and smashing it down. So it's giving you a false representation of what's really happening. It's not giving you high and low. So when you're looking on your LCD, you're like, wow, this looks amazing, HDRX, huh? But it's not. So when you, when you get it out in post, you're going to be like, wow, I didn't know that was three stops over. So it's, it's compressing it for your LCD. And that's, that's another, that's like a brother to it. That's like its partner, so they kind of, the auto lot, like optimizer, it kind of just works in the same way. So these all, these all kind of like smash your tones down so they're viewable on the back of the LCD. And then, I think that's pretty much it for actually setting the camera up on the thing aside from, you know, oh, the white balance. And then you always want to, you always want to do your white balance in Kelvin so you can adjust it accordingly. You know, because you don't really want to go in there and just be like, oh, okay, because I mean, maybe your lights are kind of slightly more, so you're kind of just 34 or 37, or you can kind of match it to your scene to scene. So you're not stuck and you don't have something baked in, you know, it's not just like one color overall. I mean, because in Photoshop, that's just a simple white balance, you know, but it, when you're doing video, it's a different story, man. In After Effects, like you're like, oh, I got the tone out, but then your skin tones are green, so it's, <laughs> it's a nightmare. And then that's where all the high-end color grading programs, when you're putting windows on people's faces and opening people's you know, eye lights and stuff like that, so it becomes a real hassle if you don't do it right from start. And then, um, yeah, we have the Kelvin story, though. <clears throat> yeah, um, does, every, does, everybody, does anybody know what, um, where degrees Kelvin came from? What it what it um, what it represents. It was, um, <clears throat> I'll go th go through it briefly, and it's it's a rather nice way okay. of kind of understanding color temperature. Color temperature is the quality and color of line, and um, uh, basically it was um, uh, believe it or not, degrees Kelvin was invented by a guy called Kelvin. Do you know his <laughs> first name? <laughs> Um, but it's basically the act of, in a vacuum, heating up a block of um, black iron. And uh, when you get to 3,200 degrees, um, it replicates exactly um, the same color, um, 3,200 degrees um, of studio lighting. And um, <clears throat> no, it's, it's done in a vacuum, because otherwise the uh, iron would just sort of start burning and oxidizing. But um, um, and it's almost like uh, when you stick a piece of iron or a blacksmith sticks a piece of iron in a fire, first of all, it goes red and then it gets, they apply the bellows and it gets white, what they call, um, you know, yellow, and then it goes orange and then it goes, well, actually it goes orange first and then yellow and then white and then they call it blue hot. And um, um, if you actually heat the iron um, up to 5,600 degrees in a vacuum, it has exactly the same color as um, daylight balanced color film and obviously um, degree it, and it's a rather nice way of thinking about it because if you think of this piece of iron just getting hotter and hotter and hotter and going <coughs> cooler and cooler and cooler and cooler um, and just think about that sort of iron it's a really nice way to think about um, how color is described in terms of the color quality of daylight and um, it varies enormously I mean if you go up into the mountains and you're shooting in um, in a shadow of a snowlit valley, and all you've got above you um, uh, is blue sky. I mean, your your Kelvin could be right up to seven thousand almost, or even higher. I'm actually not sure, but it it can just be enormously um, blue. And um, to a certain extent, you can evaluate this by looking at your. Uh, um, um, your sensor, your, your um, LCD on the back. But it's also difficult because um, everything that you see is interpreted by the brain and so you tend to compensate. It's rather like um, if you've been wearing yellow sunglasses, um, after a while you get completely used to 
everything, and then suddenly you take them off, and for a few minutes, everything, everything looks blue. <laughs> and because um, you, your brain is working overtime to stop you from actually seeing what you're really seeing. Um, and it's always constantly interpreting and, and messing with your actual photographic eye. And so um, the more that you can um, be aware of that, um, the better you will be in terms of um, being a cinematographer and having the ability to um, uh, control colour, which is very important. And, um, you know, where you can really see the tonality of colour on people's face is the difference between one side of their face and another. I mean, you um, people become um, uh, completely... In general, people are completely unobservant about colour. You, you know, if you do an interview with somebody standing um, in a park, 99.9% uh, .9 of people wouldn't notice that they just happen to be completely green under their chin and under their nose because of the sunlight bouncing off the, off the grass. And so um, all of these things, you need to separate your brain from your eye and start to be aware of looking at an image um, um, the way it actually is rather than <clears throat> the way your brain telling you it's fine because we're so used to kind of looking at somebody on a golf course or in a park that you don't see that stuff. And um, um, it's, it's a very important and integral part of becoming a good um, photographer, cinematographer, is to be aware of light. I mean, I've been on shoots where I was, um, uh, commercial shoots, where suddenly I've noticed that the actor in front of the camera suddenly sort of gone really orange, and uh, and then you just look to the right of your camera and you realise your, your first assistant cameraman's put on a, a day glow orange coat. Yeah. <clears throat> People don't notice these things and it's incredibly aware to start to um, separate your eye from your brain and start to look at an image for what it really is look at the shadows what's going on in the shadows look at the bounce coming up off um, um, somebody's pink sweater or you know if somebody's like this and sunlight's hitting them if they're wearing a red frock inevitably all the shadow zones under here will be red and, um, <clears throat> you know, this is all part of being observant and so on and so forth. So that's the, um, um, the reason for uh, wanting to set things on degrees Kelvin because it gives you control. Um, if you leave it to the camera to automate any of these things, you're no longer controlling the image that you're capturing and you want to be in complete control, especially when... Um, you know, all, all of these cameras all suffer from the same thing. They suffer from extremely high compression. So um, H.264 um, is really, I don't know <clears throat> what it is, but it's 10 times yeah. compression or something. It's huge. Um, it's the best web compression. Yeah. It looks amazing on the internet. And that's why it was, because it was developed for journalists, so they could send it over the air. Right. But, uh, we actually uh, skipped over it. You can actually... Uh, when you're shooting under like metal halloid lights and like those nasty like quartz lights, there's actually a white balance shift in the camera that you can kind of go into it to kind of mellow it out. And then um, you can also take the saturation down a little bit because if you're baked in completely orange, you're never going to get that back. But if you're desaturated and you go into a color reading room, you can bring that back up. Yeah, that's um, things like. Um, you know, um, I mean, everybody knows sodium vapor lights are very common, you know, outside and, and very often on a, on a low budget film, you might be, you might find yourself shooting a scene with, um, you know, um, sodium vapor lamp. So taking the color saturation down a couple of notches. Did, did we actually go over that part of the menu? No, um, we didn't. Okay. I, uh, we switched out. Okay. Um, so let, let's just have, do you want to do that now or um, we'll just go over that little section of the... Uh... Steve, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Um, just to clarify, are all the settings that you're showing right now, uh, the camera settings in the keynote PDF, is that part of the downloads? Will um, that be included? Yeah, well, there'll be a version to download. There will be. It'll, yeah, it'll be available at the end though because I kind of got to like restructure it. Okay, so. so if you purchase the course, then you can totally. you, you'll get all this. Yeah. All right, appreciate it. So. so you go in here, and then it's white balance shift, and then you can actually see, you can actually wow. twist it. 
and go back and forth through all your whole your whole gamma. So you can really go anywhere with it. And then it, it, it helps huge when you're like shooting under those nasty lights and stuff. I mean, because I do a lot of color grading and like I'm just like, ha ha. But here you go, man. <laughs> Orange, just make it look good. What? And then compensating, and it just it, it turns into an absolute nightmare. But you always want to kind of use this hand in hand with your saturation too, because if it's really bad, just take your saturation down a couple of clicks, and it just it's going to be so much better. Yeah, because you, you can always put it back. <clears throat> you know, it's much easier to um, add a little bit of saturation um, when you go into. Uh, um, Final Cut or Premiere. Um. Yeah, I mean, even the basic, you know, color programs will do it, you know. And then Final Cut's attached to color. Color is a professional color grading suite. I mean, aside from the rendering, it's still pretty efficient, you know. I mean, it's not quite as nice as like a DaVinci or a New Coda or a Luster system, but like, I mean, it'll definitely get the job done and it's well-rounded for the 5G. And then uh, I skipped over the sound, too. So we need to go back to the sound menu. Do you use picture styles? Um, yeah, we're going to get into that one. Uh. Well, because uh, basically you go through the, we're going to do the house settings, and then like Technicolor actually has their own profile for it. And then there's a couple other yeah, ones, like that. Marvel and stuff like that. So we'll go into the sound real quick, and then we'll go back to the picture style. Oh, it's in the live view. So we always set our sound recording to manual. Just because, like, I mean, there's a couple times where people have shot a bunch of music videos and they thought mm -hmm. they were going to be really clever and use, pl like, pluralize, but they shot from outside while the car was moving and it, all it was was <laughs> Well, I think pluralize reads by the vectors in the, the wave histogram. Mm -hmm. And, like, when it's just flat bar, it's not going to work. <laughs> so you always kind of want to monitor your peaking and your sound levels. That way, if you're kind of try to line something up or you had any kind of markers or if you're shooting with an H4N or something like that, like you could actually line it back up and it would be pretty efficient. And uh, Pearlize, it works with After Effects, Premiere, Final Cut. Like, I mean, I think they make a version for everyone. I think it's like a hundred bucks too. Yeah. The 7D hasn't given us this yet. No? Uh, the the uh, meters. It's, I mean, it's pretty much not that big of a deal anyway, even with you monitoring it. I mean, it's, it's like nothing. I mean, you just plan for the worst that you're going to get aliens chime in on your 5D. <laughs> I, you just hear all sorts of sounds. You're like, what? Because you hear your hands. And then the knobs, when you click, like all that, uh -huh. it's just like, <laughs> it's so loud inside the camera. It That's just crazy. picks up everything. Yeah, I mean, you can hear everything. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a nightmare. But hopefully, the, all we need is a Thunderbolt connection, SDI. <laughs> And uh, XLR and 4K, and then, you know, <laughs> maybe if we say it on live TV, maybe they'll catch it or something. They'll be like, oh, hey, <laughs> let's just do that right now. I mean, because they can. So, I mean, they've already, you know, done enough. So. All right, now we'll go back to picture styles. So, picture style. We set it on neutral, and this is, this is where we start. And then you actually have to go in, and you have to click on info to activate your picture style. We set the sharpness all the way down to zero. And we set the contrast all the way down to negative. That'll basically give you something that like resembles like a log S or a log C to give you that kind of reverse S-curve to give you that really flat image to get the most dynamic range that you could possibly get out of a 5D. So you can kind of just draw it back on. And then you can leave the saturation the same unless you were shooting, you know. It's, it's all to your eye, too. Until you shoot with the, the Technicolor one, then that one's pretty locked. So, but it's, it's pretty much all to your eye. And then the color tone, I mean, I wouldn't ship that because it's, I mean, it's just as easily done in post and like you don't want to like have that baked in and be like, well, I really didn't like that. And every time you got to redo that for your reel or something, you have to correct for that. So this is, this is the most optimal settings that they found on house. And then there's actually the cinema or the, the Technicolor profile. Steve, can I ask fun. you a question? Yeah. Um, Jeremy in the chat room, can you talk about 
why you dropped the sharpness again? The sharpness? Yeah. Basically because you want your image to be kind of flat like a raw. You know, you want it to come in with, you know, no adjustments to it. Just because you can always sharpen in post. You can always color in post. You can always add your contrast in post. But like, say if it was not quite sharp enough, because of the compression on the camera from the H.264, you're just going to get, it, it's just going to enhance the artifact and the banding and like all the problems that kind of come up in the shooting with the DSLRs. I think it, um, it makes it look a little bit more cinematic. It's a bit more organic looking and less digital, yeah. you know, I would say. It's just having layers though. I mean, because maybe you don't want it like that sharp because like Gail said, he likes it more cinematic and some people like it really sharp. So you kind of just cater to the masses by doing, you know, the most you can get out of the camera and then doing everything in post. Right. And, then, and the other thing is that, you know, Steve's right. I mean, in the end, um, um, you should end up, <clears throat> these are just guidelines. I mean, um, you should end up doing your own tests and deciding what you like for yourself based on what your workflow is. Um, because you might, um, you might like it to look sort of very video-like for a certain project. You might want kind of um, a gritty kind of um, video sharpness if you were, you know, especially if you were pretending, um, you know, um, shooting a little movie that was supposed to be shot from the POV of a video camera that was um, a tacky video camera. Maybe you'd love that. <laughs> um, this is just the basic settings that um, we use, knowing that we can basically have maximum flexibility later to do anything we want. And maximum flexibility on H.264 isn't very much. You don't have an awful lot of wiggle room. It's all, it's, it's really baked in, so you, you can only slip and slide a little bit, <clears throat> you know, in terms of color and, um, you know, the various aspects of the way the picture's captured and uh, compressed, you know. So, so this one, this one gets really flat. They actually drop their saturation down a little bit. So they just want it to be like all the way. And like there's actually a demo that I actually did a shot on the corner of like a full cine style and then a graded cine style. And you can actually see how much dynamic range you can actually get out of it. But it's not really like a true test because like Seattle's pretty much like a huge soft box. <laughs> And I was like, I was trying to find like bad stuff and I was like, wow, there's like shadow detail everywhere. And like it was just like perfect latitude through the whole thing. But in California, it was just like harsh sunlight and just all the way through. And you're just like, it just, it's either one or the other. You're either exposing for the highlights or the midtones or the shadow detail. So this one, um, you can actually go online and pretty much read all about the Technicolor Cine style profile. And it'll go into like, huge depth with you and, the, and when you download it they'll give you the LUT which stands for lookup table. It's a grading tool so when you, it'll actually go into your browser and do all the optimal settings because I don't know all you guys are probably still photographers so you know when you profile something it's the same thing in video. That's what an LUT is. It's basically a profile for your editing system so it can you know help you work on it the most efficiently. And then yeah that's all on the cine style. Got the ISOs and things yeah, that, one, that one's the next one. Cool. So here's the ISOs. So these are the native ISO settings. Again, these are what we found and you know everybody else in the world, aside from you know people that haven't ever messed with it. But for some reason, it always works in multiples of 160. Like, you always get the least amount of grain in the multiples of 160. So, I mean, 100 is way more grainy than 160. Mm -hmm. And you can actually do these tests by just leaving your lens cap on and just shooting raw, like, raw pictures and just enhancing the grain, and then you can actually see how much more there is. 1250 is about the most you want to go, and that's, like, the worst-case scenario. Like, I probably wouldn't shoot above, like, 640 unless you... Uh, have some experience with After Effects or you know any kind of like noise reduction or have some other kind of cool tricks that I don't know about, which there's a million people that do. So this is kind of a reference of all of them. It's really hard to see because we really need like a huge screen to do it. Apparently, apparently the uh, the worst settings are the 125, 250, 500, 1000. Um, you pick up a massive amount of noise in the blacks and. Um, 
I'm not sure why technically why that happens, and I don't know why. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, that was the reason why I was saying I've, you know, sort of um, asked Canon and begged with Canon if I could possibly talk to somebody about getting, um, you know, sort of 80, um, um, 40, 20, and 10 ISO so that I could uh, um, shoot much wider open on exteriors without having to use NDs. Um, but, um, of course, you know, the, uh, the sort of professional or semi-professional side of um, the 5D camera <clears throat> or the 7D camera is such a tiny part of their market that, um, you know, your, your questions aren't um, necessarily of top priority, you know, so um, it's difficult. And also, you know, um, very large companies um, uh, take um, quite a while to respond, you know, um, which is the reason why so many of the accessories for um, uh, to make the cameras user-friendly in terms of shooting are made by other companies because just within a few weeks they can make brackets and make this and make that and it doesn't have to go through committees and panels and departments and all of those sorts of things. So, you know, but anyway, this is, this is a great test. I love this. This is the 160. This is actually the CineStyle. So, I mean, you can see it's, it's pretty flat. So that's the 160. I don't know how good you're going to be able to see the grain. So that's the 320. You can start to see it in like the shadows. But the 320 actually, like Gail was saying earlier, it actually looks the most cinematic. It feels like it adds like that, yeah. that right amount of grain just to kind of make it work. So we're getting a lot in the noise here. In the, from the 640, like you can just all, it's all, it just stands in your like shadow detail and you're just like, oh. and then that's, that's when it's just prone to banding. Like you just get something that's really dark and it's just gonna start doing a pattern and all sorts of stuff and you're gonna be like, oh, hey, cut that out and that's gonna be a nightmare in post. And then you got the 1250, which is pretty much noise all the way across. And then this is a 3200, which is a, just like a bunch of colored sand. So, but it's pretty cool. So, and then I think the next one is the, so this is the Technicolor that I went back through. So, did a cool little intro for it. And then this is it without grading. This is just your flat out Technicolor. And then this is uh, what it looks like when it's all beautiful. So. I think we will, um, on house, we're certainly going to adopt the um, Technicolor City style because, um, you know, it's really difficult to actually prove that you, um, you know, what dynamic range is. You can do all the tests in the world, but in the end, to a certain extent, it becomes, it becomes um, um, you know, your own personal judgment because all the charts in the world sort of don't really... I mean, who shoots charts? Do you know what I mean? It's like um, you don't make movies of charts. You make movies of people moving and things happening and stuff like that. And um, I, I, kind of my instinct tells me that you do, by using cine style, probably get about another two thirds to one stop of dynamic range, which is worth having because I, I don't know. I mean, in my humble estimation, I think um, uh, dynamic range on the the HD DSLR cameras is around 10, 10 and a half stops max, just about. On film, it's about 14 and a half. Um, <clears throat> you know, so you've lost two stops at both ends, you know, which is, it's almost like going back to reversal film, which is where reversal film used to be. So you've got to compress life a little bit more or try to avoid um, extremely contrasty situations or on the other hand, embrace them because there's nothing you can do about it. Right. Um, we only got one spot where it's clipping too. It's clipping right here. Right. So, I mean, it's pretty fairly easy for the grade too. I mean, I just put some color back in it, drew. There's a window here because it got a little dark when I pulled the curve down and then there's a window on the sky, but it pretty much captured all the way through from shadow detail all the way into the sky. And there's actually some texture in the clouds. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could actually really crank on it and draw it back in, but we just didn't have the time to kind of make it happen. So, but you can do this with, you know, your profile. I mean, 
if you don't want to be a color grader, just set it on landscape, crank the color all the way up, and then just <laughs> edit it in Final Cut. I mean, you don't have to use all these like color generators and color tools. It's like, it's your camera. You can kind of do whatever you want. You know, Vimeo is free. You get a free account. So, be your own filmmaker. <laughs> Patent something that's crazy, and then someone will come for you for your look. Be like, oh, what'd you do? You're like, I didn't just shoot on landscape, and you know, just hide all your settings. So.